过脚。用หนึ่งแบบกัดมันโตกัดจำรายการในเตะวิธีสามนาคาหนึ่งเราดูการจุนตือลำนางทรายปัญญาดำไปมีนอกกะโครงการมันโตกัดตั้งสมรสได้เดาจะปลุกสะสีสตีลเฮดเดอร์ส่งจุนขอบคุณ Mr. President Mr. Hedda File 5 Tab 10 Should be um, again a Nouvelle du, du Cambodge document Should have 12.7 in the top right, which you're confirming. This is document number E3-167. It's a document from the Nouvelle du Cambodge Campuchia Information Agency, and it deals with a speech given by Q Son Pong in North Korea. Can I take you, please, Mr. Hedder, to the final page in your pack, which should be a page with 00280591 in the top right, top left hand corner. So the, the final page in English. This is, I repeat, English ERN 0028. Sorry, forgive me, I've got the wrong page, um, Mr. Hedder, forgive me. It's page. Well, I have to use the ERNs. It's page 0028-0586. This is Khmer 0059 and French S zero 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 one two two. And in reference to the speech, there is this extract. On the contrary, the Cambodian People's Na National Liberation Armed Forces attacked the enemy forcefully and are now solid solidly implanted at the very gates of Phnom Penh and Phnom Penh itself, the last hideout of the traitors, has become a burning battlefield under the increased pressure of our People's National Liberation Armed Forces. On the 18th of March, our People's National Liberation Armed Forces liberated another city, Udon, by annihilating all the puppet soldiers there, along with their reinforcements. In other words, over 5,000 enemies were eliminated, 1,500 of whom were captured. Close quote. Now, Mr. Hedder, at the time, were you aware of this speech about Udong or other speeches about Udong or other references being made to Udong by anybody in the leadership after the events in Udong on the 18th of March? 1974. Um, I'm sure I would have read this in the blue teletype Fibus version in the Thank you. I'd like to move on to another subject, which takes us, please, to tab 14. You have behind that tab extracts from document number E3-1815, which is the book by Ben Kiernan, How Pol Pot Came to Power, and we referred to extracts already from this book. This is the epilogue to Mr. Kiernan's book, and at the start of the epilogue, he states, in June 1974, according to Pol Pot, the CPK Central Committee met and decided to launch the decisive offensive to liberate Phnom Penh and the whole country. Reference is made to footnote 1. 
and footnote one references a document in French which relates to um, the anniversary of the CPK and the date given for the pronouncement by Pol Pot is the 27th of September 1977. Mr. Heder, can I ask this? Were you, um, ha have you either seen the original document or aware of the reference by Pol Pot to a central committee meeting in June 1974? Um, yes, with the caveat that the archive rat and the translator and me would prefer to see the Khmer original to see what term was actually used in Khmer, particularly since the phrase central committee is not in quotes, so it could be Ben Kiernan's gloss. Um, I don't have it available in Khmer, but the next document that we're going to is available in Khmer. Can I, can I take you please to tab 15? I hope you have an English version and a Khmer version, but can you please let me know if you don't have the Khmer version of E3 slash 11. Mr. Hedder, it's going to come through in a few minutes. I'm going to read an extract in English, and then I hope by the time we've done that, that the Khmer is going to be available for your consideration. Uh, I'm going to it now. Uh, Mr. Hedder, can you confirm that you have E3 slash 11 references a revolutionary flag special issue September 1977? Is that document you have? I can see you confirming. Can I take you in the English, first of all, to page 36? The Khmer page for this, which I'd like to come up on the screen, please, if possible is zero 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 six three one six two through six three the French is zero zero four nine two eight three six and this is page thirty six Mr. Hedder in the English version. The extract reads as follows. At the beginning we concentrated on attacking the enemy's weak positions in the countryside with combined military attacks by regular and guerrilla units with mass demonstrations to strike the enemy and take power in the villages and communes. In this way, we liberated and expanded in the countryside every single day and isolated the enemy, encircling them a few large population centers. At the same time that we tied down enemy forces in scattered positions where the communications and supplies became more and more difficult for them. Mr. Hedder, I'm handing over now the Khmer version. I hope it's also on the screen, but I hope that with both documents it will help. Mr. President, can I hand over the Khmer version of this document? Mr. Hedder, I'm continuing with the extract, still on page 36. There's then a summation of what had happened from 1970 to 1974, and then this, and I quote. 
when the lines of communication on ground and river were cut in 1974, the American imperialists and the clique of the traitor Lon Nol found themselves extremely isolated in Phnom Penh and a few provincial capitals. It was during this situation when our party's central committee, in the course of its June 1974 conference, resolved to mount the decisive offensive to liberate Phnom Penh and the entire country. Close quote. Well, I'll read on, in fact, because it makes more sense. I'll read on. We dared to mount this decisive offensive because we had fully grasped both the enemy's situation and our own. The plan of our offensive was as follows, to attack Phnom Penh, cut off the lower Mekong, and attack the provincial capitals still under the temporary control of the enemy. The control of the lower Mekong was the key factor in the total liberation of Phnom Penh, the attacks on other towns being complementary operations. Carrying out the decision of the party central committee, during the rainy season of the year 1974, we actively prepared our forces politically ideologically and organizationally, and in terms of the combat line on the battlefield, our entire revolutionary army audaciously fulfilled the party's mission of making the decisive attack. Close quote. Mr. Hedder. Without speculating, without giving opinion evidence, relying on factual sources, is there factual information, aside from the speech of Pol Pot, which you would like to see the Khmer? So aside from the speech of Pol Pot, or aside from this revolutionary flag, on the subject of the Central Committee of the CPK, meeting in a June 1974 conference and resolving to amount to mount an offensive to liberate Phnom Penh. Um, this is not a very satisfactory answer, but I believe so, yes. I can't off the top of my, he my head specify where. Um, on the issue of translation, it's party center throughout and not literally party central committee. So make of that what you will. So that we're clear, if we take the sentence, it was during this situation when our party's central committee in the course of its conference, are we to, in effect, on your evidence, insert when our party center committee, or, or can you just help us on the sentence that I have, trans I have given to you? It was during this situation when our party central committee, in the course of its June 1974 It's simply and ambiguously party center. I think throughout, I haven't checked every last reference, but I think it's throughout. Um, this particular one sentence. Uh, Mr. Hedder, can you just say the term party center in Khmer so that we have that on record? This is Machampa. And the phrase that follows conference is, in my view, correctly translated. So we're clear, resolved to mount the decisive offensive to liberate Phnom Penh and the entire country.
when our when when our party center in the course of its June 1974 conference. Can I ask the question this way to see if it helps? Are you aware of the next party center conference? after June 1974. Uh, conference is a bit of a slippery word. It doesn't say plenum, which means a meeting of all of the members. It says conference. And so we have both party center, which is somewhat ambiguous, and conference, which can refer to a meeting of more than the usual membership or less than the usual membership. To my knowledge, the next such conference was in May 1975, but there could have been one in between. I just want you to just pause a moment and just think, because you've said in respect to other factual references um, about the June 1974, let's call it Conference Party Centre Conference, whatever else. But if you pause a moment or even think about this over the next 20 minutes for some asking other questions. Are you able to assist us at all on what other sources go to Party Centre Conference June 74? I'm going to ask it again at you at the end of your testimony. Yeah, I'll think. Yeah. <laughs> you, sa you said in your evidence earlier that it was in Jan January 1976 at a certain meeting when Kyu Son Pong became an alternate member, a, a full member, sorry. Can you just confirm that again, please? January 1976. Uh, yes, there's a party. Congress in January 1976, which, to my understanding he, he, and to my knowledge, he was elevated from alternate to full membership of the Central Committee. Next, please, tab 16, still in file 5. This is document number E3 slash 687. It's a New York Times report from the 9th of July 1982. And it's talking about three Cambo exiled Cambodian leaders, reference to Prince Norodom Sihanouk, Son San, and Q Son Pong. On the second page that you have, Mr. Hedder, which is English page 0012280, and Khmer 00651187, and in the final page of the French. In reference to Q Son Pong, this article states, and he acknowledged that millions of Cambodians had been sent out of Phnom Penh and into the countryside as a result of a collective decision. Had he joined in the decision, Mr. Q. Sompong chuckled dryly and replied in French, yes, evidently. Close quote. Mr. Hedder, Relying on direct factual information without expressing an opinion or speculating, is there any other factual information as to Mr. Q. Sompong's involvement in a collective decision uh, to send people out of Phnom Penh and into the countryside? Um. 
not to my recollection, yeah, not in my files, unless there's something mentioned in the interview or the discussion from 2005. Thank you. Can you move, please, to index number 18? This is a collection of Amnesty International material. Can I ask you to disregard the first document you have, which is dated the 18th of February 1976 and has written in the top corner D84-2.3. Please go beyond that document. We then arrive at a document which is, in fact, E3. The document number that I'm not referring to is D84-2.3, dated the 18th of February, 1976. The next document is E3-3864. This is a letter from Amnesty International to Q Sampon, dated the 28th of February 1977. The subject matter is in relation to uh, people who have been handed uh, in Thailand and handed back to the Democratic Kampuchea authorities. And I also then want to move on to the next document in your pack, Mr. Hedder, which is the final page in your tab, which is document number E3-3311. This is a letter from uh, Amnesty International. And if I can quote, it's dated the 8th of May 1977. The heading is as follows. This is, in fact, a press release. The heading is Amnesty International Concerned and Democratic Kampuchean Governments lack of response to appeals. Amnesty International today, the 8th of May 1977, expressed concern at the lack of response by the government of Democratic Kampuchea to its past appeals and inquiries. The international human rights organization said that in February this year, it had appealed to President Khu San Pong to look into the fate of 26 Cambodian citizens forcibly returned to Cambodia by Thailand in November 1976. The 26 persons, mainly farmers, but including an 11-year-old child, were later reported to have been executed shortly after their return to Cambodia. The appeal to President Q. Song Pong was contained in a letter which also referred to reports alleging summary executions and maltreatment of civilians by local authorities in some areas of Cambodia. As with previous inquiries made by Amnesty International to the government of Democratic Kampuchea, the letter has remained unanswered. Mr. Hedder, relying on factual sources, no opinion, no speculation. Is there factual evidence contained in documents showing a response, whether formal or informal, from Q Song Pong or the DK leadership by way of a direct and unambiguous response to the concerns raised in these documents by Amnesty International. Um, I think I can answer 
positively not, because these Amnesty International files were reviewed by me in the mid, mid to late 1980s, and there was no such, there was no evidence of any such response in those files. You said earlier in your testimony, I think you said late 1978, when you met Ng Sari and Nat at a UN General Assembly in New York, I take it. During this period, did Ng Sari, Nat, or anyone else there who had any connection whatsoever with Democratic Cambodia ever say to you that responses had been made to refugee complaints, Amnesty International reports, or any other documents indicating mass atrocities in Democratic Campuchia. I don't recall anything of the sort having been said to me. There was a document, if I recall correctly, that was a public document that was addressed to the UN by Yen Suri, but nothing was said directly or personally to me. And do you recall what that document said, the one addressed to the UN by Ng Suri, in the context of the complaints being genuine, part of propaganda? You know, what was the, the, if you like, the formal response to the nature of the complaints that were being made? Uh, my recollection is it, in, in, in short, said that it, this was propaganda and false. Next, I'm sorry to have to take your brain to different years, but it's the way criminal evidence goes. You said that you arrived in Phnom Penh in, I think you said 1973, I can't remember if the year was May or September, September, and you then were present up to the 11th of April 1975 when you departed to Bangkok. I'd like please to ask some questions about the humanitarian situation in Phnom Penh. Now, can I ask you first of all to paint a picture perhaps in 1974 in terms of the population of Phnom Penh? Did the population of Phnom Penh when you were present increase in 1974? Can you help us on this subject? Uh, my recollection is that it generally increased throughout the entire period that I was there. You spoke about the shelling. You said that in the dry season of 74 through to 75 the shelling recommenced and that it was continuous from January through to April 1975. Can you confirm that please? Yes. And you gave a date of the 15th of August 1973 for the, not just notional, but actual cessation of US bombing. And then when we're dealing with um, dry season 73, 74, and dry season 74, 75, um, such bombardments as there were, and you've described this already, um, were coming into you and you having to build your bunker. Is that correct? Yeah, my recollection is that it was the dry season 74 that began in late 74, latter part of 74, and ran into early 75. If it hadn't been the dry season, the place would have flooded because of the, it was, you know, in, 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 a, in a swampy area. I want to just uh, try and get into 1975. Now, we know from interviews that you had, and we've covered this already, that the offensive 
to attack Phnom Penh began at 1 a.m. on the 1st of January 1975. Now, from your position resident in Phnom Penh from the 1st of January 1975, can you explain, was there a period when you were aware that things were hotting up, fighting intensifying, bombardments becoming more regular? Um, in that latter part of 74, notwithstanding the artillery fire coming from the southwest, there was generally a kind of lull on the battlefield, um, and some in the Khmer Republic took that as a sign that the Khmer Rouge, for lack of a better term, um, were somehow militarily weakened. Uh, but the Japanese military attaché, who I mentioned the other day, and other foreign embassy military sources, um, told me at the time that this was in fact an indication that forces were being concentrated for a large-scale attack on Pan, uh, which indeed began that New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, 31 December 74, 1 January 75. Um, and I did my bit as a journalist on the morning of the 1st of January by going to the opposite side of the Mekong facing Phnom Penh, where the Khmer Republic had forces and forces which were driven into the, into the river by the attacking uh, Khmer Rouge forces. Uh, after that, my, um, I, I, I would try on a daily basis to tour the shrinking defense perimeter around Phnom Penh, uh, which I actually did on the morning of the 11th of April, uh, the morning that I left. Uh, earlier in the morning, I toured one part of that um, perimeter and uh, had some discussions with some FANC troops. Um, who were horrified when I told them that I had been given word that the U.S. Embassy was going to evacuate all of its personnel because they knew that meant that the U.S. Embassy, or they understood that to mean that the U.S. Embassy had concluded that the situation was militarily hopeless and that therefore their situation was militarily hopeless. Um, as for your question about the situation inside Phnom Penh, as I said before, it became increasingly chaotic, increasingly fraught politically, um, and I I, I don't think I, I previously mentioned that um, I had, I, I, maybe I, I did allude to it, I had fairly good contact um, with the students and the workers, um, and I was interested in the issue of what was going to happen when the Khmer Rouge came into Phnom Penh. There was one particular university student leader, who, if I recall correctly, was named Gun Thun Tanarak called himself Bing, alias Bing, and I put that question to him. He was a leader of the, of the, student, of the university student. I put that question to him maybe on the 8th or the 9th of April. Um, what, was, what was the revolution going to do about the administration of Phnom Penh, given the situation in, in the town. Um, and he said to me, you don't need to worry about that. We'll all be out farming the fields. Um, and I didn't get it. I didn't realize what I was being told. It was only after Phnom Penh was evacuated that I realized that I've made an enormous journalistic error by not, real, by not understanding I've been given a scoop. So the Phnom Penh Party underground, or at least parts of it, were aware that this plan was in place. And were you aware of this student leader's connection with the underground from other sources or from previous reports or contacts with him or others like 
Um, it was said by some people in the intelligence, embassy intelligence community that he was part of the, the communist underground. Um, I don't know whether I can say this, but he later shows up in S-21 records as having been arrested uh, sometime in 77. Um, so it appears, uh, implicitly at least, as part of the apparatus in that context. I want to ask about the Mekong River. Now, what, what was, I mean historically, what I mean is 73 when you're there, 74 when you're there, moving into 75 when you're there. What was the supply position in terms of the Mekong River and supplies coming from Saigon or elsewhere? Um, so, to explain, what part did the Mekong River play? in ensuring that Phnom Penh was properly supplied. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. I object to this question. Is this uh, inviting uh, an uh, from the Mr. President, I didn't give my usual introduction. Can I give the usual introduction to the question? And then I hope there won't be objection. Without expressing an opinion, without speculating, relying on direct factual information that either you saw or came to you, can you assist on the Mekong River and its importance, if any, to supply? Um, it was a matter, this, this issue was a matter for some discussion between me and various military attachés, um, and it was clear to them and to me from them um, that the supply of food and the supply of ammunition up the Mekong from southern Vietnam to Phnom Penh was crucial to um, the military and economic situation, survival, if you will, of Phnom Penh. And I remember quite clearly having had a conversation with one particular military attaché, I believe it was an American, not the Japanese, um, and I asked him what could happen that might result in the Mekong being cut, um, and he said, mines. And within a couple of weeks, that was indeed the way in which the river was effectively blocked. Mines were laid across the river and the troops were stationed so that when boats coming up the river attempted to cross the mines that were strung across the river, they would be hit by gunfire, particularly recoilless rifle uh, fire from the banks. Who was laying the mines? Did you ever see the mines? or the result of collision with the mine at this time. Um, my recollection is that I was told that the mines were being primarily laid by, this is by the military attaches, by East Zone and Special Zone divisions. Um, and I don't recall having gone down there myself, um, so I'm not sure I can speak to that directly. Although subsequent to April 75 and up through, um, in, in subsequent, if you will, again, Khmer Rouge for lack of a better term, uh, propaganda, there were photographs published of um, ships that had been, had attempted to run this mine blockade and, and had been hit by the coilless rifle or other fire from the banks. Did the blockade by the Khmer Rouge have an effect on the amount of supplies coming into Phnom Penh? Yes, both were 
greatly reduced. The only alternative was to bring in things by air, and the quantity of food and ammunition that could be brought in by air was less than could be brought up the river. Relying on direct factual information without speculating, without giving an opinion, can you give factual information as to the, um, the nature of air supply and whether that remained constant or was ever compromised in any way? Um, I'm a bit hazy on that. My memory is that the so-called air bridge ended be some time, and I'm talking now days or weeks, not months, before the 11th of April, but I'm not absolutely sure about that. In terms of hospitals in the period, I mean, let's say late 74, perhaps through to April 75. Um, did you visit any hospitals? Do you have direct factual information without speculating or giving an opinion on the extent of civilian casualties in hospitals? What I mean, civilian, civilian casualties being treated in hospitals in or around Pompey. No, I didn't do that. You had dealt in your previous testimony with specific examples of executions or people telling you about executions or you seeing bodies in Udon in March 1974 and Kampong Cham also in this period. My question is, from the time you arrived in ຈະສັບໄປລະຫົດດອນໄງທີ um, there were reports, stories, um, but it was always very difficult to confirm any of that because, of course, it was impossible to go to the sites. Um, and again, I think the, the best work was done by Don Ronk, previously mentioned. Just so that I'm clear, did you, were you interviewing refugees who were coming into Phnom Penh, um, say late 74 up to April 75? Um, I did some of that, but um, I was trying harder, not with great success, um, to make contact with and interview people who might uh, have connections to the, to the party, to the Communist Party. Relying on factual information without speculating or giving an opinion, was there any factual documentation showing that the Khmer Rouge had liaised with or requested from international or domestic relief agencies assistance of any kind? Not to my no not to my knowledge, uh, no. Such of the refugees that you did speak to, or that others were speaking to, what were the res refugees fleeing from? Um, Fighting in general terms, 
um, including um, fleeing, and fleeing the advance of Khmer Rouge troops, um, fleeing the threat or the reality of shelling and bombing by the Khmer Republic armed forces. Um, and I must say, even though I was given that story that I given to do that story that I described the other day about what people expected to happen, almost all of that, of what I was told, I would describe as speculative. And that's why there were two very different streams of thought, um, neither of which was based at least among the people to whom I spoke, or seemed to be based um, on any real direct knowledge. Thank you. I'd like you please to obtain file two. I hope that you have the transcript of your interview with Ian Suri on the 17th of December 1996. This is document number E3 slash 89. I am starting, in fact, with the, f the, the commencement of this interview. The record shows you, SH, Steve Hedder, saying as follows, and this is to Ian Suri. I want to start with the problem of genocide and ask for your comments on my assessment of this situation. Based on the evidence I have seen so far, I believe that there was no plan to commit genocide, but that a genocide took place as the result of a combination of four sets of policies and practices. And Mr. Hedder, I'm going to break the four down. So, one, first, there was a plan to carry out proletarianization by organizational math methods, that is by compulsion and very rapidly. Second, there was a plan to carry out Khmerization by the same forceful methods at the same speed. Third, Anyone who opposed, resisted, or failed to carry out these plans could be considered an enemy or a traitor to the nation and the party because these plans were considered essential to making Cambodia into a strong socialist country capable of independence from the capitalist world and Vietnam. Fourthly, anyone accused of being an enemy or a traitor could be arrested by the security service, tortured into confessing and implicating others, and then The power to arrest, torture and kill existed formally or informally from the centre, right down through the zones, sectors and districts, to the cooperatives and within army units. And the use of torture created the most subjective multiplication of the number of enemies. At the same time, the economic and military failures of the revolution resulted both in numerous deaths and more and more accusations of treason within the ranks. 
the overall result was genocide, even if it was not planned as such. For the moment, close quote. You have here put four elements to insulin. And you stated them in the interview. First, second, third, fourth. My question is, had you formulated those four themes? In other words, had you prepared those four themes or written them down as a set of questions before you actually asked them to insulate? Or was that you speaking off the cuff? Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Euh, J'interviens à ce stade-ci parce que nous sommes là à une limite extrêmement délicate de l'interrogatoire de Monsieur le Procureur. Je m'explique. J'entends bien que la manière dont euh, Monsieur le Procureur vient de formuler la question euh, est une façon euh, détournée euh, de... Euh, faire parler de génocide à, à M. Eder. Je rappelle que, comme euh, nous l'avions indiqué, euh, enfin, comme, euh, pardon, Mme le juge Falkreich l'avait indiqué lors de l'interrogatoire de l'expert hein, Philippe Short, euh, la question de la définition euh, et de euh, la caractérisation euh, juridique du génocide ne peut pas euh, sortir de la bouche de l'expert à ce stade-ci. Et en tout état de cause, elle ne peut pas sortir de la bouche de M. Eder. Alors j'entends bien que nous prenons ici la source à une, inter une interview à de M. Eder avec M. Yengsari qui fait partie à des documents versés en preuve. Mais à, je pense que nous sommes tous dans cette salle à, des juristes et nous, nous savons qu'aujourd'hui, la question que vient de poser à M. le procureur a pour à, but à, de parler de cette caractérisation ou pas de génocide, quelle que soit euh, la manière de rappeler euh, euh, les, les, les questions qui ont été posées euh, par M. Eder. Donc, mon objection euh, sur euh, cette ligne de questionnement est que nous ne pouvons pas entrer euh, euh, sur euh, le détail euh, de ces questions parce qu'elles ont trait, encore une fois, à une caractérisation et un avis euh, de M. Eder dans la manière dont il a posé la question à euh, M. Yengsari et qu'à ce stade-ci de nos débats, ce n'est pas autorisé. Mr. President, the purpose of the questioning is not to go on about genocide or aware of that offence within this court. To quote again, I know you know this, but I'm not sure my learned friend was here last week when I made representations. The question shall be directed primarily to evidence the witness gathered during the interviews he conducted. So I'm simply asking a question on an interview he conducted. I'm not trying to make a point about genocide. I'm simply asking for preparation to arrive at these four questions. Can I oui, Monsieur le Président, précisément, euh, nous sommes d'accord que c'est bien une interview de Monsieur Eder avec Monsieur Engsari et je n'ai absolument pas de difficulté à reconnaître ce point. Mon problème est que lorsque dans l'interview, nous parlons d'une caractérisation juridique qui n'est pas dans le champ de ce processus et que c'est une caractérisation juridique qui est faite à l'époque par Monsieur Eder, qui est son avis, euh, qui est tout à fait respectable, mais qui n'en reste pas moins son avis. La manière de présenter la chose comme simplement une question comme une autre, euh, relevant de tous les interviews que M. Eder euh, a pu effectuer, euh, n'est pas juste dans le sens euh, juridique. Encore une fois, euh, il ne s'agit pas d'une question anodine. Si nous avions euh, des interviews de M. Eder avec différents protagonistes de l'époque qui parlent de la caractérisation juridique euh, des faits, je vous euh, opposerai la même objection. Donc il ne s'agit pas de savoir si c'est une interview ou pas effectuée par M. Eder. 
Il s'agit de savoir sur le sujet précisément de la question de M. Eder. Nous sommes dans la, caractérisa la caractérisation juridique et cette manière de poser la question par M. le coprocureur vient à parler de qualification juridique qui n'a pas lieu d'être dans le cadre de cette audience et à travers ce témoin qui n'est pas euh, témoin expert aujourd'hui et qui plus est lorsque la, ce type de question a été posé euh, à M. Short à l'époque, qui est expert, n'a pas été autorisé par la Chambre. Donc, euh, encore une fois, nous souhaitons simplement qu'il y ait une même logique euh, dans les décisions de la Chambre. Oui, merci, Monsieur le Président. Donc, bah, la, la Chambre m'a euh, chargé de, de savoir qu'elle rejetait l'objection qui a été soulevée euh, dans la mesure où euh, les questions euh, concernent euh, la préparation euh, de l'interview de M. Yang Sari et non pas l'analyse juridique qui pourrait être faite du problème du génocide. Mr. Hedder, four themes prepared in advance, or did they come to you as you started the interview? Um, because of the obstruction of my trip to Pai Lin, the Thai authorities that I described, and the fact that Yung Sari then had to travel from Pai Lin to Chan Buri to meet me there. I had lots of time to prepare. Um, my recollection is that I probably for this opening PhD dissertation disguised as a question um, wrote down rather extensive talking points. Maybe not what's here word for word, but the talking points were there. I'll add that I, I, in doing so, I was not making any claim to having a, a legal understanding of the notion of genocide, nor expecting Yung Suri to, to have a legal notion either. Of course, in the academy, this is a term that has many contested meanings. It was rather an attempt on my part to use that rather provocative word to elicit an answer from him that would, would, would address the, the, the four points, among others, that, that I was raising. Uh, and can we deal with Ying Sari's response to your four uh, things? Ying Sari's first words, as recorded, are, I also see things that way. Is that a correct reflection of what Ying Sari told you in his first answer to your question? Yes. In the sentence, third Knong sentence in, Ying Sri, or this document says, Ying Sri, Ying Sri Ying reply, however, as you just said, the acts committed were aberrant, and once they were in motion, they caused great suffering to the nation. These are my views on your view. Can you confirm that that's an accurate description of what Ying Sari said to you in this second answer? Sorry, first answer. Yes. It records Ying Sri going on to say to you, so, like you said, as the revolution was beset 
by more and more complications and problems, the number of human beings who were said to have done wrong increased. I am in unison with you on this. Is that a correct description of what Isari said to you in this first answer? Yes. The record continues, Ing Sari. The record continues, Ing Sari. And your two points. First, that this was done in order to establish a more formidable communist foundation for the country, more quickly than on Vietnam so that Vietnam would not be able to keep up and would not dare to try to take control of Cambodia are true. This was generally true and was the common understanding of the leadership. Is that an accurate record of what Ing Sri told you in this first answer? Um, yes, except for the, I, I guess, obvious typo, typo. It should be more quickly than that in Vietnam, not on Vietnam. Thank you. Your second question to Ing Sri, we're moving over the page. This makes it English 0041 Question, Stephen Hedder. From what point in time was there a decision or an understanding that it was necessary to do things in this manner? Second answer, Ing Sri. It was right there from the time a victory was achieved in the five-year war against aggression. The notion was formulated from that time on. However, it was not until late 1975 that it was really stipulated that it was imperative to go all out to carry out a really fast communization in order to make it impossible for the Yuan to take Cambodian territory. And that is when the acts that were committed began. However, this idea, that the fear of being swallowed by Vietnam, that Vietnam would come in and take over, had flowed through us since way back when. Is that an accurate reflection of what Ing Sri told you in this interview? Yes. Next question, Steve Hedder. So then, was there some sort of central committee level meeting in late 1975 at which certain specific objectives were set forth in this regard? In September 1975, there was a meeting to decide what we had to do then, to keep Vietnam from coming to take control of Cambodia. Your question. So was this decided at the standing committee level or by the central committee as a whole? Answer. It was only the standing committee, not the central committee, the standing committee, Steve Hedder. So who was in the standing committee and who was at the meeting? Virtually all of the standing committee was there. Pol Pot, Nguyen Chia, Seo Pim, Me, Son Sen, Tamok. Steve Hedder. Steve Hedder Sur. And Von Vett or not? Von Vett. Von Vett. Von Vett. Von Vett. Yes. Von Vett. Steve Hedder. Steve Hedder Sur. And Q Sompong. No, but Q Sompong was present. Was present. 
but was not a member of the standing committee. He was a member of the standing committee. Sadnum of the North West is your question. Kingsri, the North West. He was not yet a member of the standing committee, but he attended that meeting. Koi Thuong was also there, even though he too was not on the standing committee. He was there. That was all as far as I know. Steve Hedder, that's all. Steve Hedder, the number of military commanders. Is that an accurate record of what Ingsri told you in this meeting? Yes. Slide, bye. Jang Hai. I'm moving to a final subject. I'm not going to present documents because I don't have time. From your factual information, without expressing an opinion, without speculating, relying on interviews you had or other factual information, is there factual information about the documents that you have presented? Is there factual information about the documents that you have presented? In significant numbers of people from areas in Cambodia to the north region after April 1975. So to make the question clear, I'm not asking about the initial evacuation in April 1975. I'm asking about if any. A subsequent evacuation or evacuations that happened at a later. Stage. Yes, there, there's certainly um, a lot of m mention of this in those interviews that I described that I did in connection with the um, mortality survey, as I called it at the time, because part of that standard questionnaire was um, asking the interviewee where they were throughout each part of the, of the regime between April 75 and January 79. So in fact, almost all of the 1,500 or so, if I recall correctly, um, interviews done for that mortality survey, I call it. Um, Gave an indication uh, of where, pe whether or not people were moved in the latter part of '75, um, and many, many indicated they were moved and then attached to those, uh, linked to those quantitative uh, interviews based on a questionnaire. There are many, not all cases, specification either on the back of the survey, a uh, back of the questionnaire, or in separate notebooks, uh, description of that re-movement of population, mostly from the southwest and east to the northwest um, and north, or special sectors that were subsequently part of the does the information that you've referred to indicate by and large whether those movements were voluntary or forced? Um, combination of both, I would say. Um, I can't off the top of my head. I'm sure I ever did a statistical analysis. Um, some people were persuaded, believed, um, what they were told, which was that the food situation in the Northwest was better or likely to be better than it was in the Southwest, and at least in some parts of the East. And I can say from having talked to many Cambodians over many years, including prior to the, these discussions, this was a this was a, a widespread Cambodian belief that the northwest of Cambodia was a kind of uh, rice basket where there was high productivity, considerable land available to be cultivated. So some people went 
because they believe that once they got to the northwest, their lives would be better. better. Um, others um, were very reluctant to leave behind the rice that they had, the paddy that they had planted uh, and cultivated and was about to be harvested at the end of 1975, thinking we worked hard to produce this food and now somebody else is going to eat it. And who knows what the situation may be like uh, in the Northwest or elsewhere. So there were, there were both views, both, both people who were prepared to go and people who didn't want to go. And in those who didn't want to go, can you give us a flavor or specific examples of the nature or type of force that was used or exerted on them in order to encourage them to go to the rice bowl areas? Um, well, simply put, I mean, people were told they had to go whether they wanted to or not. Um, and in, I think the overwhelming number, in, the over, in the overwhelming number of instances, did what they were told. Um, I don't think, given the circumstances, there was a necessity for them to be told what would happen to them if they didn't go. Uh, many of them had already reached the conclusion that not to obey orders was uh, to put oneself at risk, at least of detention, if not execution. And in terms of conditions in the areas after they got there, effects on livelihood or effects on mortality, again relying on direct factual information or from interviews, can you uh, tell us what the conditions were like for the people once they arrived at the rice bowl areas in the forthcoming months? Well, they were arriving at the rice bowl areas. I think it's fair to say that generally the situation was worse and in many places it was much worse than it had been in the places from which they had left. Mr. Heder, thank you. Mr. President, I've gone over a few minutes and I thank you for that time. I can confirm that the OCP has now finished the questioning of Mr. Heder and I'll pass over to the lead co-lawyers for the civil party in the right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. President. Mr. President, I just have a quick question. Do you anticipate that the civil parties are finished with the motion after the motion? របស់ចប់ប្រចប់ទៅតែអាចនឹងស្ដាប់សំណើនិងសារណារបស់យើងខ្ញុំកាលសាលាសម្ពិសាតាមុនបានទេបាទអរគុណនៅការតម្លឹ